This is a review of the year nine end of term four test for 2020. I propose to take you through and do the test as we go uh, so that you see my thinking, you see what the right answers are supposed to be and I can give you some tips in terms of uh, the examiner's perspective. So uh, question one, speed and velocity are different quantities. Complete the sentence. Velocity is a vector. You need to just know that. Uh, and velocity is speed in a given direction. One mark for each of those. Figure one shows the distance time graph. So you're thinking about how to interpret distance time graph when you read that. Distance time graph for an athlete in a running race. Use figure one to determine the distance of the race. Well, if we look up here, the race stops at E, and that is two small squares above 40. Each small square is one, so it is 42 kilometers. Nice and easy. The time taken for the athlete to complete the race, well, that is... We are two small squares across there, and each of those two small, each of those squares, what have we got, is worth 10 minutes because 10 squares is worth uh, 50 minutes. So each of those is five minutes, 10 minutes then for the two squares. 210 minutes. What is the motion of the athlete between B and C? Well, you have a straight line, so uh, it is a constant speed. So there's the answer there. Moving at a constant speed. Which section on figure one shows the athlete moving at the highest speed? So here we're looking for the steepest part of the graph. And the steepest part of the graph to me, the one with the biggest gradient, because of course the gradient of the distance time graph is the velocity or the speed, uh, it's A to B. So that's the one there then. How does the section you gave us answered in part D show the highest speed? Well, it has uh, the highest gradient. It is the gradient we're after there. Or it has the highest or largest gradient. Either of those two answers or three answers would do there. A car following the race accelerates at a constant rate in a straight line. The velocity of the car increases from 1.9 meters per second to 3.4 meters per second in 60 seconds. What's the change in velocity? Well, the change in velocity, of course, would be 3.4 minus 1.9, which is 1.5. Calculate the acceleration of the car. Well, the acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the time. So it is 1.5 divided by 60, which is 0.025. So there we have two of our marks. And our final mark then is for the units, meters per second squared. So in an exam, I wouldn't expect the question to be split like this. I would expect it to say, this is the situation, what is the acceleration? And for you to get three marks for that, including the unit. So you would be expected to know the formula, and if you don't know the formula, you will get no marks for the calculation. If you write down the wrong formula, 
and you even get the right answer, you're still going to get nothing. You cannot get any credit for using the wrong formula. And note the meters per second squared for the unit. Which graph shows how the velocity of the car changes as the car accelerates? Well, if we go back to the question, it says accelerates at a constant rate. So you have a constant acceleration. The gradient of a velocity time graph is the acceleration. And so you're looking for a, a straight line of constant gradient, constant positive gradient. It's that one. That has no acceleration. That has an acceleration followed by a deceleration or a negative acceleration. And that has a constant negative acceleration. It is B is the answer there. Question two. We have a slinky uh, representing a sound wave. We have the coils of the slinky. The hand will move backwards and forwards there to make these uh, different patterns. So A, uh, if you followed the note on classroom, A down here, rarefaction, uh, I will accept no pressure area. B is a compression, and again I will accept a high pressure area. And C, the distance between the middle of one compression and the middle of the next, well that you should know is the wavelength. So there it is, three marks. You just need to be able to label those diagrams like you were told in class. Information from a hairdryer, which of these is the power? Well, of course, power is measured in watts. It's got to be 2,100 watts. What is the equation which links current potential difference and power? Uh, you need to know this equation. You need to remember it. So power is potential difference times current for one mark. Now remember, in your GCSE, your physics GCSE, about 40% of the, the marks will come from maths and the application of it. If you don't know and or you're unable to use the equations that you need to know, you are going to drop those 40 marks pretty much, or 40% rather. That, that's disastrous. Make sure that you know your equations. Part C, mains electricity, what is the frequency? It is 50 hertz. Again, you need to know that. So make sure that you do. Uh, in this case, there's only one mark. So the capital H small z is not required for the mark. But you should know the units. You should know how to write them down. It is either capital H small z or it is the word in lowercase. You can't mix that. You can't have a capital H there. You can't have uh, a lowercase h there. Neither of them is acceptable. Some electrical appliances use batteries. What type of current does the battery supply? Only direct current from a battery. The hairdryer is connected to the mains electricity supply by a plug. Draw a line from each wire. Live is brown, neutral is blue. The insulation around the earth wire has two colours. Green and yellow in either order. Green and yellow, yellow and green. Brass is an alloy of copper and zinc. Give two properties of brass that make it suitable for uh, use in a plug. Well, clearly it has to be 
on a lateral conductor, it would be pointless to use something which was an insulator. So what else makes it good, do you think? Well, I, I think if you consider what happens with plugs, they're in and out of the wall quite a lot. You want it to be a hard material. Uh, that's pretty much all I would think of. But uh, if you think about uh, other metals that you could use, sodium is a metal. Sodium isn't hard, but it is a conductor. It's also very uh, reactive. So you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't choose to make the, uh, the prongs of your plug out of sodium uh, because it would corrode really, really quickly in air. Um, you wouldn't make them out of aluminium uh, because they're soft. Aluminium is very, uh, very easily bent. Uh, and uh, so corrosion resistance, hardness and uh, electrical conduction would be three things you could say. I would have gone with conduction and uh, a hard material so that it doesn't bend or wear away. Part H then, describe how power is transferred from the power station to the consumers. So you have a step up transformer, you have overhead cables, you have a step down transformer. And this is a four mark question. So we're looking to make some good points about this. What are we going to say? Uh, we step up the voltage or better the potential difference which decreases the current since power equals potential difference times current. This reduces the heating of the cables and so increases the efficiency of the transfer of energy. So I'm quite happy with that. Um, transformers and cables are the national grid. Uh, we step the PD potential difference down again at the consumer end of the grid. And that's because high potential difference is likely to cause uh, arcing. That is to say, uh, if you've got 132,000 volts from the cable and the earth, you put a, a tall building in here or uh, a crane or something, it closes the gap between the cables and earth and that very high voltage could jump, a spark could jump from the cable through the crane or through the building to earth. That's dangerous. So out in the countryside where there aren't any tall buildings, 
uh, and cranes are not likely to come underneath the cables routinely, then it's safe enough. But in here near the towns, or near in the towns and cities, near homes, near uh, high-rise blocks, all that sort of thing, you step it down so that there's less likelihood of that uh, arcing taking place. And we don't use it at 132,000 volts. We use it at maybe 3,000 volts for heavy industry, but typically uh, 415 or 230 volts uh, in schools and in homes. So that's what I would say. And uh, the mark scheme talks about uh, the cables transmitting at very high potential difference the transformers changing the potential difference. Um, the, the cables being at a higher potential difference, the step down decreasing the potential difference, step up increasing the potential difference. Uh, the potential difference for the consumers is lower than at the power station and lower than in the cables. So I, I'm happy that I have covered everything in the mark scheme there. But what I did, without looking at the mark scheme, I said, well, I've got the step-up transformer, step-down transformer, the cables. My examiner might want me to know that this is the national grid, so I'll say that. I'll say what a step-up transformer does. Steps up increases the voltage. Why we do that? We decrease the current. Why that's a good thing reduces the heating in the cables, so it increases the efficiency. I meant to say uh, what efficiency is. So there it is. There's your answer to that question. Question four then. An athlete takes part in a race. What's the main force that opposes the athlete's motion? Well, that's air resistance. You might say drag. Uh, wind resistance isn't quite enough. Air resistance is what we're after. Because even if there isn't any wind, there's still going to be air resistance. Uh, which section of the graph represents a part of the race where the resultant force on the athlete is zero? Well, you're looking for a section where there is no acceleration because if the resultant force is zero by Newton's second law, F equals ma, there will be no acceleration. And that, of course, is between B and C. Second athlete starts the race at the same time as the first the second athlete moves with a constant acceleration of 1.6 meters per second squared for the first six seconds of the race. The first athlete travels further than the second during the first six seconds. Determine the extra distance traveled by the first athlete over the first six seconds. So our First athlete travels six seconds. They travel the area under the graph then. So you've got Three point eight times twelve point two and we have The rest of it then, 
we have uh, 2.2 is the rest of the time times 12.2 so that's the area of the triangle so it should be half of that So the area of the triangle in there, half base times height, half of 3.8 times 12.2. And then we have the area of the rectangle, which is the rest of the 6, 3.8 away from 6 gives you 2.2 times 12.2. So that's the distance traveled by A. On the second athlete, moves with a constant acceleration of 1.6 meters per second for the first six seconds. So your second athlete is going to do, it's going to end up at 1.6 times six meters per second. That's going to be the velocity, the final velocity. So this point, we're working out the value of that. times 6, so that's the velocity, the, uh, the point up here. It's going to be a triangle. So the area of the triangle, if we think about the second athlete, they're going to go from uh, 0 to 9.6, 6 times 1.6, is 9.6. They're going to be up here, 9.6. Uh, 9.6. They're going to be here at 6 seconds. So, 9.6 times 6 divided by 2, that gives us the area of that triangle. So 9.6 divided by 2 times 6, 28.8. This one, we have got 3.8 times 12.2. And half of that, 23.18, gives us 50.02 meters. The difference then, is 21.2 meters. Question five. Human catapult. The person lies in a cradle which is held to the ground, the cradle is released, the person is launched vertically into the air by an elastic rope, the parachute, so the person then parachutes back to the ground. Not for the faint hearted. Uh, in position A, there is a store of elastic energy. In position C, the person is at their maximum height. Describe the energy transfers from A through B to C. So I think we're probably assuming that they're about to leave the catapult at this point. So we have elastic potential energy. Let me just get my cursor to work.
So we have uh, elastic potential transfers to kinetic. Now we want to be sure that our examiner knows that we have a fixed amount of energy here. Energy is conserved. Now, what else might happen? Well, some energy is going to go into air resistance or by, by virtue of air resistance. So we're going to have You could also say that some energy is lost as internal energy of the elastic. You know if you take an elastic band and you stretch it and release it over and over again really quickly, the elastic band gets a bit warmer. So you've increased the energy stored in the elastic band, uh, in the material of it, uh, you've increased the internal energy of the elastic. So you could say that too. Um, not only are we increasing kinetic energy, but we're also increasing gravitational potential. So um, So as the elastic contracts here, as it's getting shorter, he's moving up and he's moving faster. There comes a point, of course, when he leaves the elastic. He's no longer with the elastic. And so once he leaves the elastic behind, We have kinetic energy being transferred to gravitational potential energy. And I'm going to stick GPE there as my uh, abbreviation. You should never use an abbreviation. Uh, without saying what it is. So, uh, the Mars scheme says uh, the elastic store decreases, Ke and gravitational stores increase between B and C, that's between A and B. Between B and C, the Ke decreases, the GPE increases. And what I haven't done is to say uh, AB and there's BC. Okay. When stressed in position A, the elastic rope stores 25,000 joules. Notice joules in lowercase. Needs to be a capital J on its own or the lowercase word. The elastic rope behaves like a spring with a spring constant of 125 newtons per meter calculate the extension for four marks using the physics equation sheet. So you're going to say uh, the energy stored is a half k e squared or x squared. I don't happen to remember which form it's in on the equation sheet, but it's a half times the uh, spring constant times the extension squared. So 
we know we've got 25,000 joules, and that is a half times the spring constant, which is 125 times the extension squared. So then our extension squared is 25,000 times 2 to get rid of the half and we divide that by 125 to get rid of that so rearranging the equation 25,000 times 2 is 2 times a half times 125 25,000 times 2 divided by 125 if it's just e squared on this side and the answer then is 20 because you then take the square root of all of that 50,000 over 125 which gives you 20.